between 2022 and 2023, as part of the larger Bridgepoint 8 compliance project in West Windsor, RGA re-identified a portion of the Stuart L. Reed farmstead site that would be impacted by the proposed undertaking. The project location is shown here, with the limited portion that's impacting the Stuart Reed site situated along Quaker Bridge Road. Phase 1B testing re-identified the site and a Phase 3 data recovery excavation was conducted within the threatened site area, a roughly 10 foot wide and 140 foot long segment, to mitigate the project impacts to the National Register eligible archaeological site and historic property. This limited footprint, which falls within the former front and side yards of the main residence, yielded significant new data regarding the site as it relates to chronology, farmstead construction methods, spatial patterning, consumer behavior, and dietary practices for the site occupants. The site represents the remains of a farmstead constructed sometime between 1785 and 1800 that was originally occupied by Dr. Israel Clark, his wife Elizabeth Clark, their children, and their household laborers, including potentially enslaved individuals. The Clark family and laborers occupied the farmstead until Dr. Clark's death in 1837. Dr. Clark inherited the land that contains the site from his father, James Clark Jr., in 1785 as part of a large 298-acre tract of farmland. Israel Clark moved to the new property and constructed his own farmstead sometime between 1785 and by around 1800, and his residence is depicted on a circa 1800 map of present-day Route 1, then called the Trenton and New Brunswick Turnpike. This map shows a house labeled Dr. Clark situated along the province line, the historic division between East and West Jersey that followed the rough alignment of present-day Quaker Bridge Road. Israel Clark was considered a beloved member of West Windsor's white landowning community and was the namesake of the Clarksville neighborhood. In this circle, he was known for his jovial personality and dedication to the medical profession, and he served as the township's physician for several years. He both traveled to his patients and ran his practice outside of the family home one day a week. A newspaper article written in 1902 memorialized Clark with several anecdotes as passed down from those that knew him. Stories generally mention his joking personality, indulgence in strong drink, expressive mannerisms, and his wide acceptance as the community's doctor. In addition to his medical practice, Dr. Clark's farm was a full agricultural operation with livestock such as cows, pigs, sheep, and horses, and grain crops, including rye, hay, and oats. Local newspaper advertisements also should suggest that Clark bred horses. It appears that Dr. Clark used a combination of free and enslaved laborers to manage the farm. It is important to note that while the white landowning community typically saw Dr. Clark in a positive light, the enslaved community and free black community likely looked at him more negatively for his role as an enslaver. While many documentary evidence and newspaper articles memorialize Clark as a jovial, happy individual. There are also stories of him uh, slipping drugs into the drinks of his enslaved workers as what he considered a practical joke. And it's important to remember that the enslaved community likely did not view him in the same regard. A 1946 photo provided by Stuart Reed Jr. shows the house, and a 1957 aerial photo shows the extent of the farmstead in relation to to the project area. Artifacts from the mid-19th through 20th century occupants were identified during the archaeological investigations, but no intact deposits were found that could provide clear information on their life ways. However, deposits from the late 18th through early 19th century Clark family occupation were found intact. The site was originally studied by Research and Archaeological Management, or RAM, in 1985 and 1986. Graham's excavations identified the farmhouse's dry laid stone foundation with lime plaster on the interior wall, as well as an associated builder's trench and cellar fill. The house measured approximately 48 feet long, gable end to gable end, and 30 feet wide, front to rear. A concrete pad was identified at the base of the cellar fill. They also identified a wide, shallow foundation or pier that supported the east wing of the house and possibly a chimney or a kitchen oven. A narrow stone wall, which may represent a portion of an earlier structure, was uncovered as well. Intact archaeological deposits, undisturbed by the demolition of the house and the grading of the site in the late 1950s, were identified in two of the nine excavation units. Rams Unit 1 encountered an intact builder's trench and a large quantity of wine and pharmaceutical bottle fragments that may date to the early 19th century during Israel Clark's occupation. Rams Unit 2 produced a large number of pearlware, creamware, Chinese export porcelain, and redware shirts, wine and liquor bottle fragments, and other fragments of glassware. 
The deposit ranged from approximately 1790 to 1832. Based on Ram's recommendation, the Stuart L. Reid Farmstead site was determined eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places under Criterion B for its relation to the significant historic figure Dr. Israel Clark and Criterion D for its potential to yield important historical information. Ram's excavations are shown here, uh, showing the location of all of their units and their site map in relation to the current proposed undertaking, which the limits of disturbance are shown in red, and the study area that we excavated within, shown in blue. Phase 1B archaeological testing by RGA took place in May 2022, and Phase 3 excavations took place in July, August, October, and November of 2022. A total of eight one-foot diameter shovel test pits, six five-foot square excavation units, a two-and-a-half-foot square unit, and a three-foot by one-and-a-half-foot rectangular unit were dug within the site. Fieldwork led to the recovery of 1,402 artifacts and the identification of four cultural features. One of the most significant features, feature H1, was identified in RGA's EUHB, shown in the photo on top, and EUHC, shown in the photo on the bottom. It is the remains of the main residence, including the shale foundation and the associated builder's gems. In EUHB, our excavations intersected the backfill of Rams Unit 1, which helped us to accurately geo-reference their excavation map in relation to our excavations. The exposed wall consisted of 12 courses of dry-laid stacked shale and a width of 1.6 and approximately 2.9 feet vertically of intact wall foundation. The interpreted infilled builder's trench yielded 142 artifacts that included olive green bottle glass, creamware, brick, window glass, slate, mammal bone, slag, coal, and two pre-contact Native American argillite flakes. The relatively high number of artifacts in the builder's trench suggests that there was already an accumulation of material at the site, likely side yard deposits, prior to the construction of feature H1. It is possible that the northern portion of the house was an addition erected during the middle or latter part of Israel and Elizabeth Clark's ownership period, or shortly after, which adjoined an initial dwelling that was built by Clark around 1785. Surviving information about the 1798 direct tax in New Jersey suggests that the average house at the time was about 18 by 25 feet, and the roughly 30 by 48 feet foundation found at the Stuart Reed site further suggests that there was an addition added on in the late 18th or early 19th century. Fills four and five in this unit also yielded exclusively early artifacts and are considered to collectively represent a buried side yard deposit associated with the early occupation of the Clark household. These fills yielded six creamware, two pearlware, and 13 redware shirts, 12 dark olive bottle glass fragments, and three corroded cut or hand wrought nails, among several other miscellaneous non-diagnostic materials. No later material, such as whiteware, was recovered from in this deposit. Perhaps the most interpretively significant feature was feature H4, an infilled cellar for a possible earthfast building, such as a roof cellar for an outkitchen or other auxiliary structure. The feature was encountered in EU's HD and HE, and then was further investigated with EU HH between them to expose a full wall profile. The drawing of the profile is shown here on the west wall of the three units. Several layers within the feature indicate episodic infilling, of which deposits could be separated out into two general time periods. Deposits at the bottom of the feature from the Clark occupation, represented by fills four, five, and six, and a later intrusive deposit from the Foreman and or Applegate periods that was likely placed to restore grade after the earlier infill had settled and left a surface depression. This later deposit is represented by fill two. The earlier fill layers contained primarily late 18th to early 19th century ceramics, such as creamware, pearlware, early period whitewares, porcelain, stoneware, and slip decorated redwares. Fill three, which feature H4 cuts into, is interpreted as a historic deposit from the early 19th century and roughly contemporaneous with feature H4. An 1815 mean ceramic date was calculated from 159 temporally diagnostic sherds. Feature H6 was the remnant post hole and post mold located 1.6 feet southeast of feature H4. It likely represents the remains of a post that supported the superstructure over the infilled cellar, now destroyed. The feature contained a circa 1765 to 1810 shirt of Chinese export porcelain and fragments of coal and coal ash, which also suggests that it may be contemporaneous to the cellar and was likely infilled at the end of the Clark occupation period. 
The overall circa 1785, 1800 to 1837 Clark period deposits had integrity and sufficient material to make preliminary interpretations about the site occupants' lifestyles. The assemblage reflects plural deposits related to Dr. Clark, his family, and the free and enslaved laborers on site. The contents of these deposits could not be attributed to individual occupants, although their location suggests their relation to household occupants rather than those of enslaved field laborers who likely resided elsewhere on the farmstead. The preponderance of intact Clark Pier deposits in the front of the house, where the study area was limited to, could be due to a yard use trend observed elsewhere in the Northeast where the front yard was commonly used for refuse disposal prior to the 1850s. After this, hygiene and presentation concerns led to a trend of rear yard refuse disposal. It's not unlikely that excavation on the sides of the house would yield deposits that may be related to the Foreman and Applegate periods of site occupation, but luckily we were able to target the earliest deposits on the site in the front yard, potentially. The Clark household assemblage consisted of primarily domestic material, such as ceramics and glass vessels. Wine and or liquor bottles represent roughly 24% of the glass vessel assemblage and 3.72% of the entire domestic assemblage. While glass vessels were not the most prominent in the assemblage, this is likely due to the limited excavation area restricted to the front and side yards. Rams excavations, in contrast, uncovered a large quantity of glass vessels in other portions of the site. The archaeological evidence supports prominent alcohol consumption supported by the documentary evidence and anecdotal tales of Dr. Clark's habits and behavior. Ceramics primarily consisted of pearlware, followed by redware and creamware, with a small quantity of whiteware, Chinese export porcelain, American stoneware, and others. The pearlware, creamware, whiteware, porcelain, and bone china in the assemblage reflect a common pattern of use as tableware and teaware. The presence of refined earthenware sets suggests an investment in tablewares and possibly teawares, and the types and forms of ceramics present in the household were likely influenced by women. Women were generally responsible for overseeing the domestic sphere, and it appears that the women on site during this period, namely Elizabeth Clark, preferred blue decorative elements, particularly blue transfer prints. Shell-edged embossed designs were also prominent decorative features on tablewares and teawares. Roughly 28% of tableware shirts showed some form of decoration. While a majority of the ceramic assemblage is composed of tablewares, some food preparation and storage vessels were also present. Most of the utilitarian vessels were redware, although a slip decorated charger and a possible tankard suggest some of the redwares were used as tablewares. Redware in the assemblage reflects an early to mid 19th century pattern of using inexpensive, likely locally produced utilitarian vessels that were often multifunctional. The prominence of the ceramic type for utilitarian vessels suggests local ties with the Philadelphia market just to the west, rather than dependence on more northerly stoneware producers. The Clark period assemblage suggests the Clark household was of a moderate to high social economic status and engaged with contemporary trends in ceramic material culture. The household purchased and used tablewares with styles popular at the time. Tax rateables show that the Clark farmstead experienced a period of growth starting in 1802 and peaking in 1817, when the farmstead was taxed on its highest numbers of cattle, horses, and riding chairs. It is notable that refined earthenwares were more prominent than more, the even more expensive porcelains, suggesting there was at least a degree of frugality at the farmstead or some limits to the family's purchasing power and or their ostentatious displays of wealth. Israel Clark was buried in a Quaker cemetery, uh, which may suggest that he had uh, connections to the Quaker religion, which was against ostentatious displays of wealth, although it is unclear how committed he was to the Religious Society of Friends. His drinking habits and the enslavement of human beings contrast with the major tenets of the religion. However, it is difficult to recognize or rule out Quaker-influenced behaviors in material culture assemblages. There were several limitations to this study due to its location within a small strip of land in the former front and side yards of the main residence. The assemblage is biased to that location and deposits near other sides of the house or in other portions of the farmstead would provide a more complete view of the site. The limited area, however, provided a surprising wealth of information about the occupation of Dr. Clark, his family, and the household laborers. This project could not have been completed without the assistance of those listed here and many others, so special thanks to all of them, and thank you all to you for listening.